Hello everyone, my name is Marisa Bergfield, and today I will be speaking to you about navigating higher education while living with a chronic health condition. So today we are going to be talking about multiple things. First, I would like to get started by sharing my education journey with you, so that way you know my perspective and experience. Then we'll talk about how to obtain accommodations, the options that you have, and then I will end by discussing some tips that I have learned from my time in higher education. I have no personal commercial interest, so no conflict of interest to disclose here. For the sake of transparency, I have worked for the ehlers Stanlow Society for the last two years. My first year with the society, I worked as the research and registry coordinator. And then this last year, I've actually worked as the diversity and inclusion coordinator. You might also recognize me from our Let's Chat virtual support groups that we hold. And then outside of my role in the society, I'm a doctoral student in clinical psychology a year away from my degree. And then most importantly, I actually live with hypermobile EDS, POTS, and many of the comorbid friends that come along with. Shout out to Annette for coining that term that I love so much. So today I am going to be utilizing my personal experience of having eight years of higher education under my belt. And then I will also be sharing some of my experience through advocacy, my personal lived experience and then clinical experience as well. Before we begin, higher education varies significantly and it's not right for all people and that's okay. On a global scale, laws are going to be unique, and I personally am only familiar with what is offered within the United States. Even within the states, we have both public and private schools, laws that vary by location, and a spectrum of funding concerns. So only take from this presentation what resonates with you. If something feels off, you have my permission to completely discard it if it does not resonate with you. Because after all, each person's journey is unique and valid. In fact, if you hear something that is not your truth, let us celebrate together because that means you are one step closer to finding what is your truth. Okay, with all that said, let's dive into my experience and sharing some of the things that I have learned in pursuing higher education. First, I actually did not go away to university. Instead, I opted to stay at home and attend a local community college. I'm very thankful that I did because this was the best choice for me. While the place that you attend has a lot to do with your experience, I found that the quality of classes varies by instructor and not necessarily by college. My community college allowed me flexibility, which can be true for four year universities as well. First, I could select classes that worked for me. For many of us, this is actually the first chance we have to customize our schedule rather than adhering to something that was given to us. And we can make that whatever we want. Of course, I still made the mistake of choosing early morning classes my first semester, which I do not recommend if you are not an early morning person. You can also experiment with what format works best for you. There are multiple different types of classes. So there are hybrid classes where people are online and in person. Some classes are fully online, some are fully virtual, and then there are also in-person classes as well. I was able to space out my degree, so I took less classes in the fall and spring semester and instead had classes in the summer to balance out. I also made sure to give myself extra room in my first semester to give myself grace as I started to learn and navigate things for myself. I actually took two and a half years to obtain my associate's degree, and I spent a semester attending both the community college and the four-year university that I'm about to talk about. And that worked really well for me as they were located very close to each other. Things that I learned from my associate's degree is to pay attention where those classes are located and the amount of time you have between classes to get from one building to another. If you're concerned about having enough time, the accessibility of the building, or if you're concerned about parking, 
These are things that can be discussed with the accommodation office or person at your university. If you are unsure whether a time or a format for a class will work for you, experiment with one class at a time rather than committing to an entire schedule of something brand new. Bonus tip, if you do decide to go the community college route, make sure that your classes you are selecting are going to transfer to the four-year university. After I attended community college, I finished and received my bachelor's of science um, in a traditional four-year university. Here I was incredibly blessed. I had a disabled professor for the majority of my classes, Dr. Jason Parker. Dr. Parker sustained an early brain injury and taught his class in a truly accessible way as a result. For tests, he allowed us to submit a paper or we could complete the multi-choice question exam that we were uh, more familiar with. There was an abundance of extra credit options. Dr. Parker also offered flexible attendance, so I could leave when I needed without question. He would also become quite upset if someone attended class sick because he understood that that put everyone in the room at risk and physical well-being was not worth sacrificing. So ultimately, at this point, I did not pursue accommodations because these classes were designed to be universally accessible. And that was incredible. I absolutely loved that. But when I got to graduate school, I had no idea what I was doing. Right before I started this degree, I was also formally diagnosed with hypermobile EDS and POTS, which was great, but I had no idea what to do with that information. I expected that I would go to the accommodation office and they would say, what accommodations do you want? And I had no idea. Maybe this resonates with some of you, but I had pushed through so much and accepted a level of compromise that made it difficult to see my own needs as being valid. I'm going to say that again. I had accepted such a level of compromise that it was difficult to see my own needs as valid. I thought, well, I've done it before. Surely I can do it again. I really had to realize how much internalized ableism actually influenced me. So what is inter internalized ableism, you may ask? At the top here, you can see, it is when society's prejudice and bias towards disabled people infiltrates into how we see ourselves. After years of being treated as less than or unworthy, we can come to accept that as truth. And if you're sitting or standing here right now thinking, oh, that's not me, I challenge you to lean into this one. Internalized ableism manifests in many different ways. It might show up as comparing yourself with others, compromising boundaries for the sake of acceptance or proving yourself, which is what I was doing. Self-loathing, shame, feeling like you're a burden to others, self-doubt, questioning if your symptoms are valid, low expectations, and many, many more. If there's anything I would want you to take away from this presentation, it's that you and your needs are valid. If you're putting in 120% to obtain a B, an above average grade, imagine if the playing field was level for you. What I mean is, how much different would your experience be if you were provided more resources and flexibility? Notice, I said, what would your experience be like? Not how successful do you think you would be? Lesson number two from grad school is accommodations are important because you, you are worthy, not because you need to be more successful. And three, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I have to say that one to myself a lot. And you can plug in anything you want there. Just because you can get through a degree without accommodations doesn't necessarily mean you should, etc. Now, not only did I have no idea what accommodations to pursue, I was also afraid of teachers and faculty knowing that level of detail. It's a horrible truth that not all academic environments are safe. Sometimes we avoid accommodations as a self-protection. And I respect that because I did it myself. One day I had a conversation with my professor who said, you aren't doing anyone any favors by avoiding accommodations. And I still am unpacking that and chewing on that and what it means for me in my life. 
I had to realize I, I did think that I was saving someone from a burden. And while it's absolutely not your concern what other people think about you, I realized I was playing into a larger system and treating accommodations like they were bad and worth avoiding. So I really had to dig deep and challenge that and assess my safety before moving forward. Okay, so we've talked about uh, a little bit of, of my experience and now we're going to talk about accommodations. Part of my clinical training includes writing psychological reports, which often involves writing recommendations for accommodations for people. I have seen individuals presenting with learning disabilities, inattention, academic concerns, difficulty with memory, performance anxiety, and many more generalized worry or uh, topics that are related to getting through higher education when you have chronic pain and illness, and not just getting through, but thriving. So when I write these reports, I go through a process that I actually wanted to share with you because it can be easily replicated. But first, it's important to know your rights. Now, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'll share just the, the little bit that I do know, and that is in Title III, Section 12182 of the Americans with Disabilities Act states, that no individual shall be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation by any person, and it gives multiple stipulations of how that the person, whether they own it, they operate it, et cetera. And right before this clause, in section 12181, it is specified that public accommodation applies to multiple different forms of higher education, including undergraduate and postgraduate private schools. However, it's important to note that colleges and universities run by religious organizations are not necessarily covered by the ADA. Therefore, it's really important to check policy before enrolling in a school. And I should add that many religious institutions choose to adhere to the ADA, but it is definitely worth checking and I will show you how you can do that. So step number one is you are going to utilize a search engine such as Google or whatever you prefer. You will type in the name of the university and disability accommodations, which you can see here on the screen. And to the right, there is a search image of what could show up for you. So you wanna make sure to type in disability accommodations, otherwise you will get travel accommodations. And while deals on hotels are great, that is not what we are looking for. If the initial results are not helpful, you can go directly to the university's webpage and type this in to their search bar for more information. Step number two, I've selected a random school for this example, in this case it was Harvard. You can see that when we searched Harvard and disability accommodations, there are disability resources, workplace accommodations, disability services, student accommodations, university housing, and the Accessible Education Office. Lots of options just here in this first little bit. The resource page is very helpful and worth checking out. But right now, we are looking for how to pursue accommodations. So step number two is finding the office responsible for accommodation paperwork. So here, we would select student accommodations, which is a specific page housed in the university disability resource page. In many cases, you are going to be looking for a specific office, such as the Office of Educational Accessibility, but honestly, this can be named anything. Sometimes it's housed within academic advising. Oftentimes the name can be straightforward, but sometimes people like to get creative. And then there are also these really expansive resources that some places have, like you can see here with Harvard. Okay, so number three, I have opened the page for student accommodations. At the top of the page, you can see a variety of links and resources that would be helpful. The page states that students should contact the local student disability coordinator and all of the contact information is easily listed in drop down arrows on the side of the web page. This process will look different for each school and many universities will actually have written guidelines and instructions for accommodations that can be printed out. Through my experience working with universities and schools, many places are going to ask for documentation from a qualified professional. That might mean different things to different places. They often have a specific form that they want completed. 
So it is important to ask about accommodations early. So that way you have time to make the appointment, which we know in our community can be, there can be a wait list involved. So it's especially important for us when we are trying to schedule with that trusted provider to give us enough time to complete the paperwork with them. Do not follow my example. I read online that a letter was needed, thought I had enough information, went to my provider, got a letter, went back to the office, and was then handed the proper form that my provider needed to fill out. So we had to start the process all over again. Now you know my experience, some of the things that I have been through, you know how to find the paperwork. So let's break down some of the different types of accommodations that exist. What is out there for you? There's so many different types of accommodations, but I wanna spend some time covering some of the most common that I see. As a reminder, it's important to discuss these things with your trusted provider, but I also recognize not all of us have a trusted provider, and it's helpful for us to be familiar with these options so we can advocate to make sure our needs are met, no matter who we're working with. So first is the classroom itself. Is the room lecture style with stairs going up the sides? Do you need an extra chair to prop your legs up to deal with pot symptoms? No shame in my game. I have absolutely attended class laying down on the floor. Maybe you've been diagnosed with ADHD or you're dealing with inattention. If so, sitting in an area with less distractions can be very helpful, which is called preferential seating. For homework, tests, projects, and things of that nature, there are alternative assignments. Perhaps someone has social anxiety and public presentations are triggering. A written paper or a video submission might be the perfect alternative to show that you know the content in a way that is most accessible for you and allows you to thrive. Extended time is an excellent option for individuals with unexpected flare-ups. You may not need that expected time always, but if you do, it's really helpful to have. I should also add that many professors are flexible with submissions if you're communicating with them about what's going on, but at the same time, you might not wanna disclose that information and both options are valid. If someone has a sensory sensitivity, Maybe we need to stand up and stretch regularly. Having a testing room to ourselves may also be a really great option. As uh, looking at the computer tech here in the middle of the screen, having our laptop is essential for many people. Our phones and computers have incredible technology and capacity for hands-free use, voice recognition software that takes notes for us, screen readers, magnifiers, and many, many more. With regard to assistance that you'll see in the middle bottom of the slide here, many colleges and universities hire students to take notes. So great, you have accessibility and someone gets paid to take notes, win-win. Some individuals may benefit from having questions read aloud by a person or through a program. And then for professors up there in the third column on the right, a professor can provide materials before class. Some professors actually automatically record their classes Others are okay if you record, but make sure to ask just in case. They can also increase the accessibility of presentations and materials. So in the bottom here, you can see materials can be printed, enlarged, and provided in Braille as well. So these are just a, a few different options for common accommodations within the classroom. But of course, we know that accommodations um, are also outside of the classroom as well. My apologies, I should say outside of the classroom, so getting into the classroom. So things we need to ask ourselves: parking. Do you have access to each building? Is there accessible parking or an accessible drop-off location for each building that you need to enter? Are there physical barriers to entering your class? Things as lack of curb cutouts, functioning elevators. For fragrance free in the middle here, you can see do you require a fragrance-free bathroom or other space? Speaking of bathrooms, moving down a row, what do you need to have a truly accessible bathroom? If you're gonna be utilizing showers, do you need a handrail, a shower stool, et cetera? Moving to the top right, we have housing. If you're gonna be living on campus, what things do you need to have an accessible space that allows you to thrive? And then on the bottom right, in that final third column, 
ultimately, your degree can be accommodated. You can look into substitutions or waivers for certain classes. You can change the pacing of your degree, and you can also file for priority registration, getting the first pick of classes, which allows you to really customize exactly what you want for location and classes. So now that we've covered all of these things that I hope are helpful, I wanna end with some general tips that I would share with you from my experience in working with others who have navigated higher education while also living with a chronic health condition. Find your people. Support groups are wonderful. Virtual communities are incredibly valuable. Whether it is arts, sport, plants, video games, there's probably a club or an organization for you. If possible, find a mentor. The role that your mentor serves will look different depending on where you are at in your journey. In college, this might be more of a peer relationship, someone you look up to. In higher education, moving into grad school, this might be a professional mentor that you're working with. For me, having a disabled mentor has been essential. Number three, engaging in self-care. That's on the top right column here. When I say self-care, I do mean a multi-dimensional concept, talking about nourishing the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the social, your environment, and even how we connect with the larger world. Learning to engage in self-care during a busy schedule is essential. Chances are you're probably already engaging in self-care in ways that you aren't recognizing. And sometimes it is as simple as just acknowledging the roses that are next to you on your walk or the fact that you're breathing, you're eating, fill in the blank here. Self-care is actually, um, can be a little sneaky in the fact that we're often doing it and not celebrating the fact that we already are. Pursue resources. So finally here on the bottom column we see, find out what your campus offers. Maybe there's a disability office, a student life or a resource center. Find the counseling office. No surprise here that someone training to be a therapist is going to recommend therapy. Group therapy is wonderful. You might see if that's available. Maybe there are religious services or other events that you can attend. They might even be virtual, but scheduling those positive activities where you can. Another big piece, time management. I recognize that people organize their life differently, but many people benefit from having planners, calendars, in the UK they call them diaries, and making to-do lists. So first, organize your list by what is most time sensitive. For items where time is not the top concern, you can organize by what are you in the mood to do, or by the size of the task. Completing smaller tasks helps us to feel productive. So yes, checking off that you just made a to-do list is totally acceptable and recommended. Routine can also be a beautiful thing. If your schedule changes too much to have a set time to do homework, which happens in school, using the same playlist, uh, maybe the same candle, the same environment, that helps to establish a sense of routine, even if it's not adhering to a specific time. Breaks are excellent, especially if you are rewarding yourself for the work that you've done in between your breaks. Maybe that's checking it off your to-do list. There are many different techniques that involve working for a set number of minutes and then taking a break for a set number of minutes, such as the Pomodoro technique. But there are many more and you can find what works for you. And speaking of breaks, you don't just wanna talk about these as small in-between tasks, but also taking larger breaks away from work, away from school. This doesn't have to be a vacation, this can be a staycation in your home, but taking time for yourself for that self-care for your relationships and other needs in your life uh, can be done even still in your home. Then of course we have sleep. I cannot speak on routine without mentioning sleep. Arguably the last thing that pops into our head when we are talking about college and graduate school, and yet it's essential for concentration and memory. There are numerous studies documenting sleep difficulties in college students. And ultimately, time management and sleep go hand in hand because if you're struggling with one, chances are you're struggling with both. Meaning, if you're running out of time to turn in your assignments, chances are you're going to trim down on your sleep. And if you're trimming down on your sleep, chances are how you complete your activities is going to be impacted during the day. Things that you should know, the ideal range of sleep changes and varies based on your age. So what a 17-year-old needs is different than what a 21-year-old needs. And even within these recommendations, of course, there's variation by person. You know yourself best, but this may be something that you want to work out with a trusted physician. 
Sleep is impacted by a variety of things, but Brown and colleagues found that college students were particularly negatively impacted by thirst, environmental noise, and worry. Other studies have also documented how things like caffeine, nicotine, and other substances can impact sleep. When we eat, our exposure to light, including blue lights from phones and screens, all of those things have been shown to impact our quality of sleep as well. So creating a regular sleep and wake time with a relaxing bedtime routine that minimizes screen time and in, with engaging in daily movements can be very helpful for our sleep. Okay, final thoughts. There is no right or wrong way to do this. Your path is your own. But the good news is, is you're not alone. You are not the first person to walk this journey and you will not be the last. I believe in you, I'm rooting for you, and I know that there is space in this field for you. So remember that not only am I in your corner, but there are many other zebras that are in your corner and are rooting for you. Thank you so much, and I look forward to taking your questions during Q&A.